Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Crew Seattle's panel presentation on the intersection between race and real estate, a discussion of racial inequity in the built environment. I am Ashley Sherwood, the 2020 Crew Seattle president, and Crew really appreciates the opportunity to bring this discussion uh, today to all of its members and non-members. I uh, looked at the registration list this morning and we have folks joining us from all over the country today. So I think that's pretty incredible. And I also think it underscores how important our industry considers the issue of race right now. We appreciate all the time that our moderator, Mark Washington, and our panelists, Andy Adams, Ken McIntyre, and Raquel Timmons have dedicated to make this panel happen. A huge thank you also to Crew Seattle Director Serena Sayani of Stokes Lawrence and also Jonathan Mannheim of Hal Real Estate, both of whom were also instrumental in putting this panel together. I am not going to do uh, our typical program introduction with a list of upcoming events and other information because I want to give us the maximum amount of time possible to hear from our panel. I will give a quick thank you to our 2020 sponsors who make programming like this possible and we thank you for your support. I am also going to go over just a few Zoom housekeeping items. I know we're all painful, painfully familiar with Zoom at this point, uh, but the presentation is being recorded and will be distributed uh, this week as soon as we can get the link up and live. All participants are automatically muted and your video and chat functions are turned off. That's to uh, limit distractions and help the flow of, of the discussion today. The Q&A function is turned on and will be on throughout the discussion. Um, Mar our moderator, Mark Washington, will take a look in the Q&A function at the end of the presentation uh, and ask some of those questions as time allows. You can upvote question. If you see a question and you think I have the same question or I think that's an important one to be asked, uh, there should be a thumbs up button in the Q&A function where you can upvote those questions and it'll move those to the top of the list. I'm now going to introduce our moderator for today, Mark Washington. Mark is a senior vice president at Eastill Secured, responsible for investment sales, equity, and debt capital market transactions within the Pacific Northwest region. He has been in the commercial real estate industry for nearly 14 years and has held a number of industry positions. Mark previously covered the Pacific Northwest region with JLL and spent over 10 years at TIAA, now Nuveen Real Estate. During his tenure at TIAA, Mark was the director of investments, leading acquisition and asset management within the region. Mark invested over 800 million in acquisitions and joint ventures and assisted in the portfolio management of TIAA's largest real estate fund, the REA, with 24 billion in gross assets. Mark also originated whole loans and subordinated debt, executed CMBS syndication, loan sales, and distressed debt workout strategies. Mark holds a BA in business administration with a concentration in finance from Morehouse College and a CFA from the Chartered Financial Analyst Institute. He is a member of a number of industry organizations and is active in those organizations on initiatives targeted at bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion to the commercial real estate industry. Mark, uh, on behalf of all of Crew Seattle's members and the board in particular, we are very happy to have you and our panelists here today. And I will hand it over to you to introduce our panel. Ashley, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate that. I don't think I'll be as eloquent in introducing the panelists as you just gave in my full background, uh, but I will try to uh, lay out the very important people who have influenced and been a part of my life for a very long time and have been bold enough to step up for this conversation and participate to discussion. Um, Andy Adams from Starbucks, who is a senior VP for the store development and design uh, globally. Andy started at Starbucks in 2004 uh, and was responsible for the, the store development and design um, and originally uh, has also held positions in Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, he's originally from Canada, which will add to this some, some interesting uh, perspective on the U.S. and how we have 
dealt with race relations and even around the, and even around the, the, the globe. Um, as we move to Raquel Timmons, who I spent a lot of time with in the Pacific Northwest, she is the pride of Seattle, uh, representing us in so many different ways. Uh, Raquel is a SEP of planning development at Seco Development. Uh, draws on approximately 15 years of urban planning, commercial, mixed use, and residential infrastructure projects. Uh, prior to joining Cycle Development, Raquel uh, was a senior planner for the city of Renton, uh, facilities legacy city projects, engaging a diverse stake of stakeholders and negotiating very complex deals. Mr. McIntyre, I have known for pretty much my entire career in commercial real estate. Uh, we've had some numbers of interactions back when I was still working at TIA, uh, a young whippersnapper uh, trying to get my handle on commercial real estate um, and provided guidance and mentorship. And so as I've continued through my career, I've had a continuous interaction with Ken and I always appreciate his thoughts. I think Ken is a great addition to this particular panel, given his current roles and past roles, uh, particularly that he is the CEO of Reese which is a minority-based uh, organization. Now, I'll, I'll not give too much on Reese and give Ken the opportunity to talk about Reese as an organization and how it's been pivotal, pivotal to minorities in commercial real estate. But Ken has also held uh, very large roles at MetLife as their head of real estate, but has also been in senior origination roles at KeyBank, G Capital Real Estate, UBS, and Chase. First and foremost, I do want to take a moment just to say and acknowledge the panelists for not only taking their time um, out of their schedules and participating in this discussion, but also their willingness to put themselves and their reputations at risk to have an uncomfortable conversation. I want to say thank you to Crew for hosting this topic, even when others just uh, decided not to. Um, the quick response from your leadership to hold strong to your mission, goals, and values is truly inspirational and appreciative. To the audience, this is my warning. It will get uncomfortable. The concept of having to look at ourselves and acknowledge what we can do better is difficult. But if there is a time to be difficult, it is now. Take off the glasses of the lens of seeing this in a way that makes us defensive, but hopefully this conversation will allow you to find some things that will allow us to grow closer together and figure out ways that we can be better together. With that, I want to turn it over to the panelists, and I'll first turn it to Andy to give him a couple of minutes to not only introduce themselves, but to give any opening statements as we jump into the conversation. Thank you, Mark. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be in this event. Uh, we've had a chance to do this a few times in the couple of years that we've known each other. I think, um, you know, as someone who grew up in Canada, not in the U.S., who's a relatively new um, introduction to the Seattle scene, not nearly as embedded as others on this call. Um, I've been learning a lot over the last three and a half, four years about race, race relations in the U.S. And my frame of reference is as a international Starbucks partner um, who's come in at a time, you know, if you think uh, back to March 2017, uh, when Starbucks was having conversations about race with a uh, a program called ha hashtag race together just after the events in Ferguson, Missouri um, it, to Philadelphia where I had a chance to really understand uh, in 2008 what uh, the status of race relations was and how unconscious bias plays a role in our everyday. Um, that taught me an enormous amount and then to today where I think the combination of um, all of us being unsettled in so many ways, but then the stark realities of race relations being what they are in the U.S. has in, you know, impressed upon me uh, the reality that we don't always understand the context in which we're in. And certainly as, a, as someone new to this conversation in the U.S., it's taught me a lot. I would just say on behalf of Starbucks and the work that this team has done through the years, and I, I can't speak nearly as eloquently as Roz Brewer has, or Ross Ann Williams or Zing Shah has, who really represents this conversation on behalf of the company. I can say that uh, the group on this panel and certainly Ken and Mark and your, your work to help improve diversity in our profession and to make sure that uh, we're a better reflection of the community that we serve has been uh, important work and I'm happy to be a part of it. So 
thank you for the introduction and uh, I'm happy to participate. Thank you, Andy. Raquel, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself. Raquel, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm grateful to Crew for the forum and to the ad hoc committee, uh, you, Serena, and Jonathan, who pulled the panel together in an amazing short time frame, and then also all of the participants. Um, I want to start by just saying we're having this dialogue because Mr. Floyd's murder moved people across this country um, from all races. And um, those voices have gotten to a level where there's um, some measure of solidarity to call out for justice. And so my feelings on this issue kind of run deep and broad. So I'm gonna ask my fellow panelists and those participating to kind of bear with me as I sort through um, some of my feelings on the issue. Uh, but I wanna start by saying that there's never been a moment in US history uh, where this kind of treatment hasn't been the case or reality for Black people. And I feel as though um, we're in one of the most privileged, wealthiest, whitest industries, and I personally represent uh, very few, if not one of the only Black voices in most rooms. And it saddens and angers me that many of my colleagues have been more concerned about looting and rioting um, as opposed to Black bodies falling in the street. And so um, I want to say that I believe personally that this isn't about intentions, this is about impact, and that racism, racism against Blacks does exist today, both in traditional and modern forms, and all members of our society, Black, White, and other, have been condition, conditioned to participate. And it's going to take each of us individually, in the least, deciding that the treatment of Black people is completely abhorrent in our uh, society and that uh, we need to constantly challenge the way we think and the way that we behave um, in order to have an actual impact. Um, and so anyway, I'm happy to participate. I have a lot to say, so I'll try not to hog the mic. <laughs> wow, Ken, I don't know how you're gonna follow up behind that. Uh, the great way to set the foundation there, Raquel, I love it. Uh, Ken McIntyre, everyone, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to introduce yourself and say any opening statements. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna follow that. Uh, I'm, the, I'm gonna feed my time back to Raquel. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, again, I'd like to thank Crew for pulling this together to, to, to furthering this conversation. Um, I think it's important to have, I think, a, a, a seminal um, institution in the real estate space um, for the work that it's done. Obviously, its constituency is, is women, and, and I've, I've been supportive of that for, um, I like to think all of my career, but certainly um, more recently in my role as the, previously as executive director of REAP, um, where that organization um, had all, approximately 50% of its participants were women. And so we, we dovetailed with what crew was doing there. Um, I, I do want to go back and just make a little correction to my bio. I was not the head of real estate at MetLife. I was on the investment committee and I was involved in some senior roles, but uh, I, I did not actually get to sit in the chair where I, I, I got to run the whole department. Although I did have dreams of that and, and they were enjoyable dreams. Uh, I had a good time at Met. Uh, but I, I want to talk about the conversation today um, in, uh, for me personally, I, I have it in, 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 in two different camps. Um, uh, personally, I, I'm looking for change in America. Um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a black man in this country, uh, I, I cannot explain the, what uh, to, to many people who are friends of mine and colleagues of mine in the industry, um, what I go through. And I think they're getting a sense of that uh, now that they're, 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 they're starting to pay attention to, to the headlines. But um, you know, I, I, I live my life in a, a, with a certain level of, of fear and trepidation that um, I guess is essentially the, 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 the definition of white privilege is, is just not having to walk around with that fear and that, that sense of, um, of self uh, that, that uh, a black man has to be concerned with. But yes, yeah, so personally, I'm concerned about change in America. But professionally, as the CEO of, uh, 
a trade association that focuses on minorities in the commercial real estate space. Um, our mission is to create more diversity in commercial real estate. And, and so that's what I do and that's what we at Reese do every day. Um, so many companies hire diversity officers and the diversity officer, uh, um, that may be their full-time job, but it's not the company's full-time job. Um, but at Reese, this is what we do. And we are creating a pipeline. We are trying to increase the um, exposure to, uh, that minorities have to what commercial real estate is and could be to them. We are providing them with role models um, like Mark Washington and like Raquel uh, so that they could understand that there are people that look like them that thrive in this industry. Um, we're giving them the tools to be successful at whatever desk they're sitting at, at whatever company that's involved in commercial real estate. And, and, and Reese's mission is to, is to just create more diversity. Um, and the, the simple objective, and, and I'll start with women, is that 50% of the population is women, 50 plus percent. 53% of the workforce is women. And if, if, if companies, if uh, uh, very few were there, if any, um, but certainly if they're not trending towards that, um, they need to look at why they're not trending towards those numbers um, and think about, because that, that, the reason they're not trending is actually the definition of systemic. So with that, I'll, pa I'll pause. Well, since Ken wanted to correct me on my shorthand and, uh, and call him the head of real estate, I'll, I'll give everyone the exact titles that Ken has held. Head of equity acquisitions, head of strategic initiatives, head of real real estate capital markets, head of commercial mortgage production and pricing. So uh, impressive, none the least, and lots of head roles from from Ken. So apologies for the shorthand. Um, with, with that, I want to move into the topics that we would like to to start to to discuss and and broach. And I think Ken and Raquel have laid a huge foundation. Uh, into what we'll try to tackle here. I believe there's a perception issue in our society today. We tend to view things in a formulaic way and the definitions associated with how things are absorbed. And these things are generally on an extreme methodology. In general, no one wants to be associated with being called a racist. The mere mention of the word race begins to bring tension into the room, causing most automatically to tense up and to become defensive. No one wants to be in the category of David Chauvin, uh, police brutality, or unjust systems. I tend to agree that the people I know do not fall into these extreme examples. To me, that is a problem. Those of us that live in this area that is gray, that benefit from the system, but sit idly by while others are um, dis disappropriately negatively affected are literally the problem on why the extreme examples continue to run rampant in the society. It is up to us to actively take charge and to do things to change America so that we don't have to have the conversations around why is this still going on? And that when we can go from our day-to-day -day lives of individual people, that the weight that black men, black women, minorities and others carry on a day-to-day -day basis can be lifted on a general way. Me personally, I come to work almost every day wearing two different faces. I have this weight of my sh on my shoulders every single day, worrying about the perception of people having on me, the perception of which I am being branded within my industry, because that affects my ability to extend my career, that affects my ability to, to do economics. But even on a, a simple basis, I, I carry the perception when I walk in the streets in a normal t-shirt and jeans, and I have to walk around with that. And every day I go home, I can't wash away my, my, my blackness. I can't wash away and walk away from that. And so that weight is constant. And I, I implore all of us to be able to um, move forward and have this discussion so that that weight is lifted so people can start to live their lives in a fuller way. And from that leads to the, the multiple conversations around diversity and how it has the overall economic and societal benefits that we will all continue to benefit from. So with that, I'd like to open the discussion to the panelists uh, about racism in the country, its connection to privilege and the misinterpretations of racism as it relates to diversity. Ken, since you're the last one to speak, and I think with 
your vast background and knowledge um, and your ability to even had grown a career that's been very, very successful um, and have the, the executive titles that most of us aspire to, those, those, those grand dreams that we would like to get to. What's, what's your thoughts on this perception of the word racism and the lack of acknowledgement when it comes to privilege? So, um, uh, I view that as a, as a loaded question. And I say that because um, having started in commercial real estate in the 80s, um, I, I, I was not, I, I felt I was not allowed to mention that word um, and, and to ask that question. What's the definition of racism or is this racism? Or do you realize that this is racism? Uh, when I was junior in my career, uh, I was very, one of very few people of color in, in the industry um, that I encountered. And even when I was in my mid-career and later in my career, uh, to, to, to offer to have the conversation, to start the conversation to say, is this racism? Uh, it's, it's not a conversation that uh, corporate America has been willing to entertain um, have any appreciation for, uh, despite the fact that it, it clearly was affecting me. And um, even and if, and if the answer was no, no, this isn't racism, and this is why it's not racism, just the fact that you raised a question and, and tried to have the conversation could be detrimental to the circumstances. So um, that's, how, that's how oppressive the concept of racism is to people of color. Um, in in America, and I I I and again, I I would say I, I believe it's very similar with respect to women, and I have seen situations where um, men in the room are making decisions about the employees, and somehow disproportionately the women and the people of color um, consistently don't get the benefit of the doubt, and when you ask the the ration, rationalizations that come out are really tough to swallow sometimes, and you know, fortunately, I'm not I'm not pro, prone to drinking a lot except socially, but not like medica med medicationally, uh, and so I, I didn't go home and like drown myself in 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 ways that I could have, but uh, it's 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 just a it's a tough conversation to have, and it's it's. It's encouraging that we're starting to open ears and minds to have the conversation today. It is beyond troubling that it literally takes people marching in the street for us to get to this point. Okay, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I, um, I completely agree with you, Ken. I think I offer a couple of additional distinctions. I think oftentimes we blend um, diversity and racism to our detriment. Um, I think that there is a clear distinction between racism and diversity and that we do need diversity and inclusion efforts and initiatives um, throughout our industry. Uh, but I think that we have to draw the distinction and illuminate some of the challenges that we have as a society, specifically around race. And um, even more specific, racism against Blacks in America, because there's all kinds of racism in America, and there's racism that exists across the spectrum. But I'd like to think that what we're talking about today is racism against Blacks in America. And, um, you know, it's, it's saddening for me. I grew up in central Seattle, and, um, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we represented 70% of the population in central Seattle. And uh, an article came out today in the Seattle Times um, highlighting the fact that now we represent 15% of the population in central Seattle. And um, I know Seattle likes to think of ourselves collectively as progressive, but there are some systemic issues specifically around racism against blacks that are playing out across our community every day. And so um, we need to figure out a way to illuminate those issues. I have some ideas. I know others have ideas. I'm hoping we get to those ideas today. But I just wanted to make sure that we're separating 
uh, diversity and inclusion um, and racism and specifically racism against blacks in this conversation, or at least I will be. I, I think that's, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, um, the, the conversation around diversity is very important, um, which is very inclusive to a lot of different functionalities. And even the idea of diversity even means diversity in thought. Um, and you can start to have diversity by checking boxes, but if you lack the understanding of the inclusion of race, then you've missed a large piece of this. Because from that, you can make all the headway you want in gender and sexual orientation, but if you still have abysmal numbers when it comes to race, then you have not actually done what you were supposed to do. And trying to actually bring equality across the organization at all levels um, is, a, is a key point. So I think that we have gone through as a society and checked the box on a number of different things and not saying that our work in diversity by any means is, is uh, far from over and they're Great. still in all these categories still need to have these different portions, but there seems to be less progress that have made when it comes to race relations in the diversity front versus other categories. Agreed. Um, Andy. More eloquently say it, Mark. <laughs> Andy, I love you to death, my man. You've done this with me a bunch of times. Uh, how's it feel to be a minority for the first time in your life? I was, well, I, I would say I was a little bit lucky to be a minority in China as well. Um, <laughs> so I've been there before, but n nothing like what, um, what you're discussing and what I've actually uh, started to learn more about as someone who lives here in Seattle in the U.S., I would say I agree with all of you that diversity and race are, are two different topics. Racism um, has to be addressed directly and having conversations that pretends it's less of a uh, corrosive um, element on the fabric of a country um, does not help the problem. Um, I would say my own you know, personal learning journey, and, and I, I think we've had this conversation more personally before. I, I feel like my learning journey with racism in the U.S. came from what we went through as a company in Philadelphia. And Starbucks has had um, uh, conversations with itself uh, going further back than that. But I had just come back from Asia and um, believed that, you know, the U.S. is just like Canada. Uh, I had spent my life growing up there. But when uh, when Philadelphia hit and uh, we had had two uh, African-American men arrested in a store, the store manager had called the police on them. Um, we went into a conversation at Starbucks that was um, really tough in addressing um, unconscious bias, but at the root of it, and probably racism that came through um, in society and how it struck at the heart of every person that cares about human rights. And as I began to learn more about the history of the U.S., um, you know, you can go back to the 1870s, the Jim Crow laws. It is systemic racism that plagues the country still today. And of course, this isn't a conversation that only sits in the U.S., but it certainly uh, weighs heavily on the intellectual capital of a country and, and its government. And it is something that, um, it is unfortunate, uh, comes only with the burden of a man's videotaped death. Uh, today to have this conversation as opposed to a conversation that's active in the front and uh, leading change on a regular basis. So as a, as a white man, uh, I would just say, um, you know, it, it's a shameful uh, thing that brought us here. Let's make the best of the conversation. Let's get action um, in whatever way we need to on behalf of um, too many years of this being sort of underground and not being brought to the forefront of the conversation in the country. But again, as a Canadian. <laughs> no, I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. And, and as we kind of continue to move this conversation and some of this is foundation laying um, and bringing folks to, I think, an understanding of the why and not the what. I think there's a lot of focus right now on the action of George Floyd um, and his horrific death, right? And, and then they, they focus in on this particular action and they say, I would never do that. 
I, I would never stand by and watch such things be occurred to people. And, and so I think we have to unpack a little bit on, on how we've gotten to 2020. Um, and Raquel, I think, you know, mentioned this, is we've gotten to this particular place because of the fact that there's been years upon years of outcries from a particular population. And mostly that population has felt as if they're unheard. Um, as we've gotten up into today, as we go through the past, I'll even go back to 2008. Um, as I was thinking about preparing for this particular panel, um, I, I was doing a bunch of research, reading some articles, trying to figure out a base. How do you, how do you provide a baseline foundation understanding and, and a, a conversation piece to go forward? Um, I found some old newspapers at my own apartment where I have articles from the week after Obama was elected. And I remember as a black person that sense of pride to the point where I've saved, even to this day, newspapers that are still here with me. And this sense of hope that came with this message that maybe we're already starting to turn that corner. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that that also incited a number of other people to feel that they were being mistreated and that the country was going in the wrong direction. I, I also have a photo on my phone simultaneously a week after Donald Trump was elected, literally almost to the exact same day. And the headline of that newspaper was acts of racism rapidly increasing. And, and so the, the mentality is after the, these things continue to be on the rise, You've seen, and obviously with the, the increase in social media, there's a, a highlight of these numbers of horrific acts happening, but there's also acts of silent protests that have also happened where we've tried to bring highlights to this. And ironically, one of the most well-known is Colin Kaepernick and his kneeling at the protest. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because his objective was to bring more attention to br police brutality, but instead the focus became a disrespect of the country. And the narrative around that was focused on how there's no appreciation, how you know this is towards the military and, and the people who die for this country and all, all these different things. But in and of itself, it, is a pro it was a protest peacefully to try and get us to this place. But in, 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 as I move to our next topic of conversation, which is to talk more about the protests and the riots, we've tried the peaceful peace. We've, we've tried to highlight over and over again, we are being mistreated. We've cried out for your help multiple times, but instead the emotionally moving piece that we've all seen is a man's death to the point where he cried out for his mother. In the middle of it, his dead mother was the point in which everyone has now emotionally connected to it. And so as we think about the protests today, it's important to understand why we're here. It's the unheard cries of years and years of people wanting to get this kind of attention, this kind of focus on a conversation so that we can elect change that has brought us here. And so in, into our next topic, it, there's a lot of controversy around the protests and, and, and I particularly end up focusing in on this idea of one message being warped into another. Um, and so protests turned to riots, which turned into curfews, a lot of lockdowns, they turned into looting and you know, economic hurt or harm to neighborhoods, even communities of, of, of people of color. Um, and so we'd like to hear all of your thoughts on when it comes to the protests, a number of things I'd, I'd like you to address is, do you think that how we got here being the horrific death of George Floyd was necessary? And in addition to that, would there be this much highlight on this conversation if it did not escalate to its point? And I think it's an interesting piece because I personally don't think that we would be having as many conversations if the economic piece hadn't gotten hurt so bad, which means that not only as an African-American or, or, or a minority group or population has been affected, 
but the wide vast of people are now being affected by these horrific acts. So what about you, Andy, since you, talk, you spoke last, let's uh, hear from you. It's hard to imagine that when people are confronted um, in the way that they have been by these events, that they wouldn't react um, the way that, they, that we have. The reality is, if you take away the tools of change and the ability to have success, to, to, to create the change that you wanna see, um, it, you're, you're gonna get what we've had, which, which is people really feeling like this is not, this is not their city. This, if, if they don't really feel like this is their community, if that's not an institution that you gain advantage from or helps you develop as an individual or your family or your happiness. And if that, in, that institution continues to put you into a place that this could happen to you and you don't have an equal opportunity for development, I think uh, people will react this way. Uh, individuals have a right to the anger and the feelings that they have. And I, I think um, looters and rioters and protests are all things that are really closely linked together and the difference is only the situation and the circumstances in which the people find themselves. Um, and certainly the early days of the protests, um, at least from what I saw as a layman who was in quarantine with the rest of us watching on TV, it certainly seemed uh, those institutions that are meant to help those things happen in a peaceful way turned it the other way in many cases and created the angst that led to greater conflict. Um, and I think if today we're seeing less violence um, in, against property and people in these protests, it's because somebody's learned something. And I see institutions taking a different approach uh, to the conversation, but it, it's by no means fixed. And I don't think uh, it's in any, any way addressed the anger that people are feeling. And again, as a layman. Um, it, while, while we're still talking with you, Andy, if, if you could address or think think about it or, or even respond in the context of your particular role and a company as large as Starbucks um, and how Starbucks has perceived the extreme piece of this on the rioting and the looting side that more than likely is also caused damaged and economic loss to the company. Um, how, how has Starbucks perceived all of this and even its role into race relations? I think when you're responsible for a few hundred thousand people and their livelihoods, as, as Starbucks is, and then of course our customers, the number one thing is safety and security of, of your, your partners. So we call every employee at Starbucks a partner. Uh, they have the ability to, to actually be an owner. And so we, we believe that Safety and security was the first thing. And, and what I saw from the US team and, and their ability to make sure our partners were safe um, was the first thing on their minds. In terms of how to actually react in the moment and understand how you can help in a conversation, this is hard. Um, it doesn't matter which of the events I listed in sort of my introduction that I've seen the company go through in race conversations since 2017. Um, in, in an event, in a crisis, and a discussion that we're having today, it doesn't matter what you did in the past, only what you're going to do doing, going forward. And so uh, for those uh, individuals that are responsible in this company to help lead us through that, I, th I see incredible courage. It's not an easy thing, but to your point, Mark, every individual in a company has to uh, think about how they can contribute. Raquel, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I don't know that I really have a popular opinion on this. Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to get on a soapbox and start to judge um, my community's pain and trauma that's been built up over centuries. Um, but what I will say is that I've seen um, the protests and the movement um, leveraged in ways that I don't like. Um, and from my perspective, it almost seems like an appropriation of the struggle of black people for political and social capital and just um, other things that are counterproductive to the actual work that has to be done and the conversations that need to be had. Um, and so I expect some of this from parts of the public, but I'm always challenged when I get into circles of, of colleagues 
who are ultimate intellects and we go down the rabbit hole of the rioting and looting um, at the expense of actually talking about the work that has to be done. And so um, I know what's happening. I'm in commercial real estate. We've had to be concerned about um, safety and security of our assets as well. But I hate that the conversation for rioting and looting is somehow automatically linked to the conversation about systemic racism in our country. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I just, I want, I want to get to a point where we're collaborating. And, and, and you know, I haven't been down to Chaz. I assume you were going to ask about it. Um, I haven't been down to Chaz, uh, but, and I've seen some of the demands that have come out of that group. And I think um, they're, they are very noble, some of them, um, and they are things that our community should work on collectively and to collaborate on. Um, I want to get to the point where we're being strategic about that design because we've seen policies come out over many, many years, different changes in law, but if they don't align business interests and oversight, uh, we're going to end up in the same spot or worse um, in the future. And so um, I I'd like to see more collaboration uh, beyond the protests. Thank you. Ken, you got any thoughts for us? Uh, tough, to, tough to add on to that. Um, you know, when you, you, you talk about the protests and, and, and how as I like to phrase, they deteriorate into looting. And um, I just, I, I see part of the, the, the challenge is there's, there's a, a void of leadership. Um, where, where we have the technology of social media, which enables a mob to gather um, and the intent is for that gathering to be peaceful, but there's no leadership to coordinate and ensure and instruct um, and guide to say that if you have this peaceful pro protest, this is, this is the process that will follow the peaceful protest. And this is the outcome that you will get because that's what this peaceful protest will lead to. Um, and so we have unguided uh, protesters that uh, devolve into a mild state of anarchy. And I don't know how else to put it, uh, but to Raquel's point, that completely detracts from what the issue is that we're all trying to address. And, and I put that under the category of, of, of change, Ch America, change for America. Um, and so I think we all need to try to have conversations about how do we make this change for America that we're looking for. And I, I would like for somebody to, to paint that vision of what that change would be. Uh, my vision of it is, hey, if 50% if of the population is women, then let's, let's stay in proportion. If 13% of the population is black, then you know, we, let's stay in proportion. If 12% is Hispanic, then let's, let's stay in proportion. Um, and when we're out of proportion, let's tend towards it. Uh, I tend to be algebraic like that because I've been an analyst my whole career, uh, but uh, that's how my mind works. No, I, 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 I'd agree with you on that. I think that um, there's a misconception around the desire and Unfortunately, I think the narrative flows in a direction of these conversations and these extreme reactions are happening in which that they're interpreting that um, we want to overthrow and become the majority um, and all of a sudden take over in power. Um, and the request is nowhere near that. Um, and and that's, that's the problem or the issues I think that over these particular weeks, months and years, uh, because part of what I be honestly believe to be a problem in this particular protest is right now we're tugging on so many different heartstrings. Everyone is emotionally uh, driven by the actions and things that have happened. But ultimately, this is a long game. And 
I, I love to hear you guys' thoughts, but I got to say, maybe I've been doing this for too long. I'm a little bit of a pessimist in the sense that I, I want to I see the people who, who are going to be here in six months, who's going to be here next year when there, there isn't a social media post and the work still needs to be done um, and the protests have died down. What, what will you do then when your day-to-day lives are, are no longer being affected? And so m- moving this through is we are, we're very passionately talking about certain small topics and I, I wanna be able to, to get to um, a few things that ultimately hope to lead to at least some nuggets for people to gravitate to the tools they can use uh, to what we think will happen next, what, what are your organizations doing and, and those type of things, but bringing it back into a little bit of a real estate mindset. And I wanna hone in on something Raquel mentioned earlier today, specifically around uh, the central district in, in Seattle and how that change has happened. Um, there's obviously a number of policies and, and systemic things that have happened in the past from redlining. So I think a more current issue in today's word, and this goes back to perception of words and how people perceive them, um, gentrification can be a very negative terminology. Um, and that comes from the idea or this concept of having these well-located minority neighborhoods that are relatively close in feel. And once a city like Seattle continues to grow and expand, it expands into that neighborhood. And because of economic reasons, um, you end up having minority populations that can no longer afford to be there and are forced to other areas or or other places. So from this, can the three of you talk about how the growth in urban planning has continued to affect minority populations. But particularly, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we can continue to engage these communities to make sure that they are um, benefiting from the rejuvenation of their communities, the economic power that is being thrown into their communities and not displacing them. And so uh, I, I know Raquel has a lot of thoughts on this. And since you started off the conversation with your comment, I'll, I'll throw it to you first uh, to comment about gentrification and how we can start to be more inclusive in our goals there. Um, I, from my personal perspective, uh, I have a lot of thoughts around this, so it's going to be hard to synthesize again. But um, ownership is key. Um, ownership is key. And I think if you look historically at um, neighborhoods across the U.S., um, that have been artificially depressed in terms of values because of restrictive covenants and redlining um, and other, you know, defunct housing policies. Um, you see these um, um, almost kind of like predatory uh, purchases over the years um, that then, or the predatory investments happen over the years once the community becomes desirable again. And primarily not because of economic reasons or anything, it's really because of commuting trends, right? And so people wanna be closer to where jobs and employment is located. And so you see this gentrification of these neighborhoods that were close in urban infill um, areas and it displaces um, or displaces um, entire communities. And that's exactly what happened in Seattle and other communities across the US. We were uh, pushed out to the fringes of the communities, ask the commute back in for employment um, and jobs, um, and it has tons of ripple effects. Um, so, in terms of uh, mediation um, of that of gentrification, I'm not sure I have all of the answers. Um, but what I have noticed is that as soon as the community becomes more desirable, you see a ton of infrastructure investment. You see a ton of upzoning that ends up being windfalls for those new property owners that now own those homes. And so I think that there is a lot to be done in terms of policy um, and um, zoning where uh, there can be influence and opportunities for investment that are as not as complicated as um, economic opportunity zones <laughs> that actually uh, can funnel investment dollars into communities, uh, black communities for the benefit of blacks um, for ownership. Um, The other thing that I wanted to mention, I was probably going to get to this later, um, just announced today is um, a 
concept of um, or a new philanthropic effort that's being housed in the Seattle Foundation called the Black Future Co-op. It's founded by um, four phenomenal women um, here, local Black women, um, and it's an investment fund for the Black community. It's aiming to raise $25 million, um, and that investment will go towards health and education and art and criminal justice and housing. Um, and they've raised a significant uh, dollar amount to date, and they're leveraging those dollars. They have um, you know, Jeff Bezos in participation, and Seahawks and Microsoft and Steve Ballmer. Um, and so I, uh, I see efforts uh, moving forward. Um, I just want to make sure that they're sustainable. And so um, in short, I say all that to say is I don't have an answer. I have a whole bunch of questions. I have a whole bunch of ideas. And I think that's where the collaboration comes in, us getting together and putting these ideas out and see what rises to the top and then creating a strategy and a design and um, some measure of oversight to ensure that our efforts are sustainable. I, I, I agree with you on that. And um, I, I think the one piece that I, I really would spend time on in, in people's thought process is not only coming up with solutions that allows Black people to be able to stay in their communities, but solutions that allows them to be able to benefit from the thriving of their communities. Um, and so there, there are a lot of funds and dollars that are being directed at the communities. Um, but, but what I would like to see is how are we partitioning those out to allow for more ownership, ownership um, so that as those communities thrive, that we can begin to attack the larger conversation around the economic gap. And go ahead. And, and I would just like to add, we can pull together trillions of dollars you know, in, in small amounts of time to address um, issues, um, societal issues. This is a societal issue. Um, and so figuring out ways to um, rectify this situation because it's gentrification is only a symptom. Police, police brutality is only a, sim a symptom. Mass incarceration is only a symptom. There's a larger issue here that can be addressed. Um, and so I, I think ownership is, is a good start. Ken, any thoughts from you on, on how we can bridge the gap and bring the communities together? Um, so uh, like Raquel, I have, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I'll start with um, sort of the platform that, that I've been operating off of here at the Real Estate Executive Council. And that is, if we have diversity amongst those that are making decisions, um, we will get to better decisions and better outcomes. And so what I believe is that um, we need to have more people of color black, brown, involved in the industry. And the real estate industry has so much power to change communities, change society, um, both uh, directly and indirectly. Um, it affects uh, the three main um, components of, of any, any society are the political system, the economic system, and the social systems. And, and through, through real estate, you can affect all of those. Uh, and so if we have more people of color who understand real estate, who understand urban planning, who understand what it means to put a road here or a park there or a, a, a hospital here or a school there and who are involved in those decisions um, and rather, rather than those who may be carpetbaggers or gentrifiers or whatever you want to call them, money grabbers, just saying, hey, I can come in and I can build this, I can make a lot of money and go on and, have, and not have a, uh, an interest in what the community is. Uh, because they were never there. Uh, but if you have somebody in their camp or in their way, um, i.e. Um, the planning commission or something like that, who says, uh, no, this community actually needs a discount grocer because it's a food desert. And if you can bring that, then I'll give you some additional zoning. Um, uh, you know, somebody, the more we have education, the more we have people of color involved in this industry, I believe we'll get to better outcomes and a better community and a better America. And that's the pathway that, that Reese is, is advocating and working to, to create. 
um, because our mission is to increase the diversity in this issue and that in, in, in this industry and, and that's why we're behind that mission. So move, moving you Andy and, and, and thinking about gentrification and how it relates on from a real estate standpoint and obviously I think you know, how, how Ken and Raquel will both answer this question there is a there's a key need for partnerships um, and potentially ways for the communities to also benefit. Um, has Starbucks spent any time thinking about these connectivities and potentially ways to try and create um, opportunities within these certain communities or anything like lines that, that could help guide, put some guideposts out there for people? Uh, we're getting a lot of Q&A questions that are, are looking for how to do this and everyone wants to, 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 to figure out how you make those steps and those partnerships. And so just wondering if there's any, any thoughts on your side from Starbucks and even the neighborhoods that you may go into and how they may relate to being able to give back to the community. I'd, I'd have to say that, um, again, in the last three and a half, four years, I've been so impressed with the work that the government affairs and public affairs team at Starbucks has done, as well as the Starbucks Foundation. Um, whether it was uh, opportunity youth employment initiatives or uh, something that came to mind, Ken, when you were speaking. And it, uh, our, we have a program, uh, a, a store type that we call a community store. Now, if we do it well, every store we open feels like a community store. It becomes a part of its community. It should reflect those that it's serving and uh, should reflect the community that it's in. But these stores go a little bit further. And so we just opened in May, I think it was May 23rd, um, in Anacosta in DC, uh, a 2,800 square foot store um, in an area where we did not have a Starbucks. Uh, there was no Starbucks on that side of the river. Um, and as that store opened, I reflected, I remembered, we had a meeting, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, at an ICSC with Mayor Muriel Bowser, who's been obviously in the news a lot lately. Um, but at that time, she was advocating on behalf of her city. And I sat in a meeting with her and her economic development team. And I don't know many professionals in real estate that had the, the command of their development network the way that she did. She took me through a map of DC, which I know far less than, than I should, and told me where developments were happening, why this, the location where she wanted us to go was important and that she, she's, she's supporting us, but we better sort of get our ducks in a row. And when can she expect to see the store open? Now, I guarantee if she was on this call, she said it takes them way too long because I've been in trying to get them there since 2017. But we opened a community store that doesn't only serve coffee uh, and doesn't only reflect the, the people that work there don't just reflect the community that uh, we're in, but actually provides uh, formal meeting places for nonprofits in that area and connects directly within the local community initiatives. And that's what we call a community store. I think the, the very best retail that I've seen is always a reflection of the community it does business in. Um, and and uh, we, we've got, this is our 16th community store. Um, I visited most of them. And the number one comment I get from our store partners uh, that work there, and, and usually this is what they say, they're so grateful that they have a store in their neighborhood because they were commuting 45 minutes, one hour into Chicago, right? Or into Houston or into Dallas. Um, and it took them away from their home and it wasn't a, always a safe commute to have a location that they can work at as a Starbucks partner, a place to make their living in their community and be closer to their family made a big difference to them. And, and uh, it shows in the stores, they, they work as, more of a community center than you'd see in the average uh, store because of how it's run and the intent of it going in. So I think we have to find ways to reflect the community better, both in the ranks of the leadership of companies that make these decisions, as well as when we, when we come to the community that we're actually reflecting the community that we're doing business in. I think when you go in uh, to a community and you just take away, uh, it's very obvious and the customers, uh, you know, if you're in retail and the customer do doesn't believe you're there to serve them, but serve yourself, you're not going to be there for long. That's that's awesome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you a little bit more, Andy here, and 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 dig into um, this 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 question on how do we continue to support um, black businesses, black entrepreneurs, things along the lines to drive 
uh, economics um, or, or dollars into the community and, and allowed to, and obviously to increase the or decrease the uh, economic gap. Um, the Starbucks have, and this is my thought process on an additional tool that we can continue to support. And this goes with not only um, employing within communities, but also as we think about quote diversity or people of color, ha has Starbucks made any efforts to um, demand and or uh, support that a certain percentage of their supply chain has to come from this particular, you know, especially if you're, if you are serving this community, then we want to make sure that we're getting at least these products from these people in this community. Do we locally source things along that lines? And, and, and obviously your, your, your company is public and, and, um, and, and large. And so I'm, I'm picking on you a little bit, but this is just, I think, it, and this is coming up in the, in the Q and A's, everyone's looking for like, what do we do? And so my, my thought process is obviously around this idea that not only are, if we're putting dollars into these communities, but whatever it takes to run our business, that we are utilizing that same community so that they can benefit from the, the growth of that community as well. Our supply chain team has uh, fairly tough supplier, supplier diversity goals across um, all of the lines that we purchase that supports our business. So those certainly are in place. Um, more sort of uh, neighborhood type initiatives. The stores that I'm speaking of, the community stores actually have uh, local contractor and diverse contractor requirements. And quite often we're certifying a brand new construction company that we might not have uh, dealt with before to bring them into the Starbucks system. And the hope is that as you open stores like this and you require um, uh, minority owned contractors to work on your, the, the store that you're opening, they take on additional work and, and, and are able to bring more sort of prosperity within their community. So that, that's at the heart of that specific store that I mentioned in that series of stores. We'll open 100, I think by 2025 is our commitment, and hopefully we exceed that. But throughout our entire supply chain, I know that the diversity goals that the teams have set are aggressive, um, and we're, we're, we're more likely to be challenged to meet them than not. So just if I can extrapolate, it obviously is harder. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the issue of where we are, is a lot of time as human beings, we tend to go with the easier, the more economical, and, and we replace those things with profit. Um, and how do I, and, and that obviously continues to perpetuate the, the problems that we see today. And so going down the path of how do you involve the community, it is having these types of goals that are tied to the executive team and making sure that they are compensated and meeting those goals and making sure that some portion of their supply chain is diverse some portion of their employment base is particularly if you're in a community having a high percentage of the people that work there are from that community putting these hard line goals in place are are significantly things that we need to do and not just say to each other and making sure that not only these goals are being said, but it's tied to how people get paid. It's tied to compensation. We, we can't continue to make these declarations and goals without actually having consequences around them. People have to be both motivated in all instances in order to move the goal forward. Um, we are very quickly running out of time here, and I do want to get to some questions that are being directly asked uh, through the Q&A. And so before we do that, I'm going to jump to one more question. Out of the eight topics, we are barely getting to half of the ones that we were going to talk about. Particularly, I want to um, have the three of you try to talk about where do you think we go from here? And, and that is a, a very broad question because this systemic racism is weighing down people at work. It's, it's weighing down our communities. There's politics involved. There's regulation, regulations that are involved. So how, however you see to answer that and then we can get a little more specific through the Q&A. But wanted to at least leave people with some nuggets with the, the little time that we do have left. Um, and obviously this is just opening and, and scratching the surface of a very deep conversation that needs a lot of time and constant uh, interaction. We, we, we probably even need to have a, a call to action for people to, to bring more folks together to continue these conversations because we can't, we can't solve the world's problems in an hour and a half on a Zoom call between the four of us. Um, but if you could think about and, and respond 
on what do we, where do we go from here? And I, I want to start off with Ken, uh, mostly only because I am familiar with Reese and I know some of the things that, that Reese has put out there, the cause of actions and the different um, uh, targeted points that are very much key to what you believe is important for us all to get on the same side of as we move forward. Well, thanks. And um, uh, where do we go from here? Um, uh, uh, my, my, um, my position from, from the Reese perspective is, as I've said before, this is Reese's mission. Uh, we're doing this all day, every day. Um, even without this moment, this, uh, the moment of protest without uh, George Floyd's murder, uh, we would be doing this. Um, uh, but if, this, if, 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 if you want to create a more diverse real estate industry, and hopefully that leads to a change in America, um, you know, this Reese is an organization that is open to partner with you to move that dial forward. If that means increasing the number of uh, candidates, uh, minority candidates for the, for the employment pool, we're working on that. If that's identifying more firms for you to partner with or invest in or invest with, we're working on that. If that means coming in and holding you accountable for the goals that you've set for yourselves in the DNI space, we, we will come in and work with you to do that. Um, this is our mission. This is what we do, um, and we can. And 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 where we are, are constantly working to partner with more and more firms, um, both minority firms and majority firms, towards the end of increasing um, the number of people of color involved in this industry. Because, as I said before, the power the industry has. I want to sidetrack the conversation. My 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 comments real quickly. And because I'm seeing some some questions about what is what is what is the root of, of racism, and I want to I want to take a stab at that. Um, the from 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 my perspective, the the essence of of racism is a essentially a dehumanization of people of black and brown people, and uh, when you see what happened to George Floyd. Um, you would not allow that to happen to your pet. You would not allow that to happen to your or your family member or your neighbor. But there's it's essentially um, for many white Americans, they do not see themselves in black Americans. And that is a, that is a very dehumanizing. And so if you want to know what you can do, besides a listen to our stories and listen listen to what we're telling you and not tell us what you're doing while we're trying to tell you what's happening to us, but listen to what we're doing or what we're experiencing. But then also when you see something happening to somebody of color, think about if that was your sister or your brother or your father or somebody, try to see if you can relate to that. And, and, and if you can't, it's probably happening because of some level of racism that's systemic in America. So those are kind of my, my thoughts to, to leave people with, um, with respect to how racism continues in America. Raquel? Um, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is what can people do? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I got wrapped up in your comments, Ken, and um, completely agree. Um, and it's emotional so, uh, for me, um, but uh, I'm gonna draw a further distinction. I, I agree with you, Ken, that this is about, uh, that we can make huge strides in representation. It's important, um, but I also know that we're in an industry that is predominantly white, and I would even venture to say that most of our participants here are white. So. What can they do beyond, you know, allowing or incentivizing or creating um, ways uh, for uh, Blacks to be further represented in an industry? Um, and I would just say to those who are participating um, that you are a tremendous set of resources, um, not just financial, but social and political capital. Um, and more importantly, there's a collective brain trust I, uh, in our industry. I mean, I've met some of the smartest people throughout my career. 
Um, and for God's sake, I mean, we, we shape the built environment. I mean, we can do better as an industry. And I agree with you. I have been met over the last couple of weeks. It's um, actually been pretty depressing um, by deafening silence. Um, and it's, it's been hard. Um, or I hear things like, I don't see color. Or, uh, you know, slavery and Jim Crow was years ago. Or times have changed. Or I have black friends. Or all the anecdotal things that try to distance uh, white people further and further away from racism. And then on top of that, to be asked, what can you do? It's pretty exhausting for a person like me. I don't know about um, other black folks uh, that are participating in those are, that are on the panel, uh, but I would just say to my colleagues that you are very capable humans. Um, you didn't learn how to design a building because you spent time in one. And um, you also didn't learn the ebbs and flows of the real estate market because you have a 401k at your company you did some work, you went and educated yourself. And so I would just challenge um, those of you um, that are interested in doing the work, first examining um, your thoughts and your feelings around the issue and then becoming more literate, whether that's exchanging in dialogue uh, with people of color and listening to their stories. But we also live in an information age. I mean, you can Google anything. I mean, anything and everything if you wanna find something out. So figure it out. Um, and do the work. Um, and then once you've done the work and you decide that you, you need to change some things, then change some things um, and bring those, those ideas and your expertise and your resources uh, to the table. And, and I also wanna just say that I don't, I'm not just challenging uh, my white colleagues to do this, I'm challenging myself, um, even for different reasons. I mean, I have a lot of pain and trauma around this issue. So a lot of my examining and re-education and re-literacy is about healing, but then also figuring out a way to effectively mobilize my own voice and my experience to inspire and create change. And so at a minimum, at a first step, I think it's about examining your own feelings and figuring out a way to become more literate and then mobilizing that literacy. Um, thank, thank you for that. I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I have, I have some commentary, but I, I want to like, get Andy's thoughts. Um, and then I'll, I'll jump in there and we'll, we'll take the last 10 or 15 minutes and I'll, I'll directly read some commentary, um, from, from our participants to the panel for you, for you to answer as well. I don't think I could add anything uh, more meaningful than what Rochelle and Ken shared. Uh, I would say the reality, the way forward, I, I actually really appreciate the educate yourself, do the work. Um, I was surprised how much I didn't know, how much I needed to fill in gaps in my own understanding of where we are and how we're here. And then um, once you do that, you start to see things in a different light. But if you're uh, uh, someone that enjoys what we're talking about as white privilege, or we don't have uh, this constantly in the background of our, our, the way that we navigate our, our day, you can't really understand unless you go deep into, into uh, understanding how we got here. And you'll never understand the exact feeling, but you can't turn away from it. I appreciate being invited to this conversation. Um, I'm not the most diverse candidate for the next role, but I would say I really, uh, you know, my experience with Mark and Ken and now my new friend Rochelle has, has been the in, invitation to the conversation and us being willing to have a tough conversation, being uncomfortable, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. You're never going to have the conversation, the depth that you need if these are things you shy away from or don't accept the invitation to talk. And so I just appreciate you inviting me. Uh, I learn every time I speak with you and as friends, I thank you. So thanks for today. Thank you, panelists. And, and, and I'll, I'll I'll throw in that um, on, on immediate things, I think we've under underrepresented the importance of how much this is a long-term game. Um, this isn't something that's gonna turn the corner tomorrow. And so what, what I implore people who really wanna know what they can do is to, to, to strap up your boots with us and to, to be ready to be in the mud with us for, for some time until we can get to the proper place. 
Um, there are, are, are a number of areas that, um, that need to be fixed. And particularly that they even go that you're voting. I think that as a society in the US, uh, we have a culture that values money over morals. And we typically vote with money. And, and that is to the extent of our social dynamics in a large instance. And I know this is a little not really applicable to uh, the belief in the culture in the Pacific Northwest, um, but even, even behind the scenes, I know plenty of people within the commercial real estate industry who may not socially agree with who's been elected, but, uh, but also voted that way because it was the most economically beneficial at the time. Um, whether or not those folks are regretting that is a later discussion, but um, having the resolve at any particular time to make sure that we are always doing things, not only that benefit us economically, but are always keeping the priority on our morals and what we would like our societies to look like and sacrificing a little bit of economics to make sure that we as a society are a place where we all can thrive I think needs to rise in the priorities of what's important to us. Um, next, it, it, there, there is a call to action here. I don't have an official one. If you go to the Reese website, there is a call to action with a number of different things there um, that you can also tie into. There's a number of questions that I probably won't be able to get to directly to the panelists that, that are asking, how do you bridge the gap for ownership within the black community and the economic gap? A lot of that is economic. A lot of portions of that means that we will have to make sure that our resources are, por are forced into that direction. Again, not as a, just a, as a dream goal, but something that is tied to people actually being compensated to making sure these things come to occur. L lastly, there is the emotional component of this. Um, I've gotten a ton of support from friends that have called. Um, I will tell you I appreciate it, but you also have to recognize and realize that those same phone calls are emotionally taxing and they are drawing more out of people than you realize. I have been dealing with this situation my entire life. I've always been black. My situation has never changed. This is now highlighted for you. For most people, getting 50 conversations, 50 phone calls, and want to talk about what, we're, what we can do, it's, just, it's a lot. And so to the extent that you can spend as much time as you possibly can to at least have a base of a conversation and to move the ball forward, it is helpful. So I will say, be aware of the emotional drain that is being pulled on, especially within commercial real estate, because there are so few of us, and so many of us are getting the same phone calls um, and the same call to action to put together panels, to do things internally, to do presentations this way. It's emotionally taxing. So we, we do need your help to be able to get others up to speed. And we can't, as a small of a community as we are within commercial real estate, do it all our own. So with 10 minutes left, I'm going to try to grab a couple, couple uh, questions here um, and try to get the panelists to answer. Let's see. I can go to the way you're looking. Go ahead, Raquel, while I'm searching for a question. Uh, so I, I mentioned it in passing, uh, but I wanted to draw some more attention to the Black Future Co-op um, and the ability to engage. It's a brand new philanthropic fund. It can be uh, found on the Seattle Foundation's website. Um, they've, um, in just a couple of weeks, raised a significant amount of capital um, and continue to do so. Um, and so your participation there um, financially or um, socially or politically um, would definitely be valued. Um, so a question that I, I can't find right now, but I did see it and I noticed it. And it's something uh, within the commercial real estate space that I hear all the time. Um, and it's from an HR perspective of not being able to find the right talent um, to continue to bring more people into the industry. Uh, and so I'm going to direct that at Ken. Uh, I have my own answer, but, but Ken, obviously with your participation with REAP, which is the Real Estate Associates Program, um, directly, directly associated with the idea of, is the talent there? Where do you find the talent? Um, how, how do you approach that? And, and what would you say to an HR person that says they can't find talented people to fill these roles? Um, after I, after I, you know, 
had a, a, a physical reaction to that question. Uh, um, but, but, but here's the talent situation. Um, it, it's twofold. One is that um, many of us do, uh, uh, minorities, people of color, don't even know the real estate, the commercial real estate in particular industry exists. I didn't know much about it. I didn't know anything about it when I was in high school and I didn't know anything about it while I was in college and I was a business major. Uh, and so, you know, we at Reese have created a program that is exposing high school students to um, the commercial real estate industry, giving them an idea of what urban planning is, the difference between an industrial building and a hotel or an office building or a mall, um, and giving them fun, some fun, fundamental foundations and also expose them to people like Mark and Raquel who uh, represent what they could be in the industry. So now that we do have a number of role models, we can go back out into these communities and touch these high school people and say, you could be this, um, you could be me, I was you. Um, and we're creating a community that will pull them through into the industry. So we, we, we have a pipeline. That pipeline includes um, students who are in college, as Mark said, the REIT program is constantly bringing mid-career transfers into the real estate industry. But there you get to the rub, which is HR people want to hire people who have experience in the industry. And it comes to the providing an opportunity. You can call it a leap of faith. You could call it whatever you want. But the idea that you can look at one candidate, and generally that candidate is somebody of color, and they may be very accomplished in everything they've done academically in their career um, and everything. But if they've not done exactly what you're asking them to do, the chance of you hiring them tends to be very, very low. And the magic is when you see these people of color who got that leap of faith, got that opportunity. And now you have uh, Angel or Gaylord Robinson, who is the head of real estate for IKEA. Um, and she was a mid-career transfer that went through the REIT program, or a Katrina Rainey at McDonald's, who runs all the McDonald's in Ma Manhattan and Queens, um, who was a mid-career transfer that went through the REIT program. And, and, it's, it's, it, and, and, and Andy, uh, Jeanette Mina, who was um, working in a technology role and is now a, a store manager for Starbucks, uh, not a store manager, but she's in the development team for Starbucks in the New York City already. And she went through the REIT program. Uh, it's, it's being able to look past the skin color and see the capability of the talent in the person and whether or not they have that capability to be trained to do what you want them to do. Because very few people take jobs that they've already done before. Most people, when they're moving to take a new job, it's something you haven't done before. Um, but people of color, don't get the benefit of doubt when they step into when they try to step up that 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 ladder, um, and so that that's the challenge that I put in front of HR people. The talent is there. The people are out there. Um, uh, if, if, if you want, I mean, I have a database of multiple thousands of people of color in, in North America, and Andy knows this is true because we've had fifteen hundred people go through the REIT program, and we have another fifteen hundred or so people connected with REIT. And I've been involved in both of those organizations at the most senior level, uh, so I know the talents there, and I know there's talent in the high schools, and I know there's talent in the colleges that would be interested in real estate if given the chance. Markel or, or Andy, any any thoughts about? Um, the, the talent that do you want to add to Ken's comments? I don't want to add, but I'm going to add one thing that, um, uh, because I think it was so succinctly said and I completely agree. Um, I also would challenge HR folks that um, the way that they're going to come, not just an experience, but even their language um, and their culture is going to be unconventional. Um, but that could be uh, the differentiator, Mark, you mentioned it, diversity of thought really creates redundancies um, in your organizations uh, all throughout commercial real estate. And having those perspectives, those unconventional approaches to life and business uh, really give you a competitive edge. So if not for any other reason, like the right reasons, um, just for an economic reason, um, we should be giving opportunities 
uh, to un unconventional candidates and people of color. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I grew up in a neighborhood where many people I think are interested in real estate because we understand that the wealth of America is largely tied up in the real estate industry. And we have um, collectively a significant um, amount of business prowess that's just waiting to be channeled into commercial real estate. So um, I'd also challenge HR folks to look um, beyond some of the un unconventional uh, ways of speech or education or employment um, and consider that as a value add, as opposed to just, uh, um, you know, a, a leg up. With only a couple minutes left, um, I, I do want to acknowledge all the folks that have sent comments, questions that we are not been have not been able to get to. Like I said, maybe this is a, a, a little challenge on the crew side to put something else together so we can continue the conversation address some of these very other important issues or maybe even dive deeper into a topic. Uh, I'm not trying to ignore you. They are all very important things. But as I mentioned, this is the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's literally impossible for us to be able to dive deep enough into um, enough topics, even one topic in, in, in a short period of an hour and a half. Uh, so with a couple of minutes left, I want to say thanks again to crew for allowing us to have this conversation. I want to say thank you to the panelists um, dear friends of mine who have provided your perspective, your insight, genuine conversation on how you're feeling and what people can, can start to try to do to make the turn and to provide a better situation. Um, next, I'd like to say thank you to both Jonathan uh, Mannheim and Serena Sayana who, who, who endured my many phone calls as we were going through this and even stepped up to the challenge as I called them on a Sunday and said that I, I really wanted to put something together to be able to provide an atmosphere that we can have these type of conversations, um, connecting us with crew and allowing us to be able to do this. And then lastly, the audience that have stayed on for this, this long and listening to this conversation, uh, we do also hear you and what you want to do. I do challenge you to reach out to myself, to crew, to other organizations. There are a, a myriad of resources that are out there. Um, and, and a number of organizations are putting together resources to connect you. It's hard for us to be able to go through all those resources on a call. And so if you want, if you do have questions, if you do want to ask for additional guidance or want to provide additional insights and your, your, your voice matters as well, we can't do this to move the ball forward without you. That's the biggest thing is that people have to realize we can't do anything until the, everyone buys in that we can move this ball forward together. Um, so finally, thank you all for participating. This has been um, a dream to be able to have this kind of open conversation. I, I really do appreciate it. I, I do honestly feel that the weight is lifting um, as we continue to address this and look at it head on and try to figure out a way to move forward.